take a moment to say the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And just a reminder, we only come to school on Monday and Tuesday. Our Thanksgiving break is Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Every year in November, a story is taught to America's school children. It goes like this. After a harsh winter, the pilgrims, oh. with the help of a native named Squanto, Hi. reaped a successful harvest and celebrated by inviting the local Indians for a friendly feast that started a yearly tradition. Yay! Almost every part of the story is historically inaccurate, and it's time to clear up the myths and lies surrounding the story of Thanksgiving. Pilgrims were an English sect of the Puritans, the separatist Protestant congregation. These Puritans didn't call themselves pilgrims, didn't come seeking religious freedom, and didn't wear buckle hats. By the time of the Pilgrims' arrival in 1620, two-thirds of Massachusetts' indigenous tribes had already been killed by new diseases brought by British explorers or kidnapped into the European slave trade. Plymouth Rock lay in the center of the territory of the recently extinct Pawtuxet tribe, which had been wiped out by a plague. Upon landfall, one of the first things the pilgrims did was to rob the graves of the Wampanoag tribe and steal as much of the tribe's winter provisions as they could get their hands on. This caused tension between the Wampanoag, who ruled over Massachusetts, and the Puritans, which continued to increase until 1621 when Massowit, the leader of the Wampanoags, found it politically advantageous to form an uneasy truce heavily slanted in the Europeans' favor. For the Wampanoags, the alliance was a necessity which allowed them to focus on fighting off other tribes invading their territory. Squanto, or his real name, Tisquantum, was a member of the Pawtuxet tribe whose territory the Pilgrims had colonized. Captured by British slavers six years before the arrival of the Pilgrims, he was sold into slavery in Spain, escaped to England, then returned to North America where he worked with British merchants seeking to exploit Newfoundland. He eventually returned to New England to find his entire tribe dead and the Pilgrims living in what had been his tribe's summer village. Tisquantum would become the key for survival of the Puritans as he showed them how to plant and fertilize corn and other native vegetables, where to fish, and how to communicate with natives. The Feast of 1621, which we think of as the first Thanksgiving, was not an annual dinner, but rather a celebration of a successful harvest after a harsh winter. A letter written by one of the 50 Puritans at the dinner, Edward Winslow, recounts that they survived this winter because of the Wampanoags, but didn't see them as equals and didn't invite the natives to the feast. During the celebration, the Puritans fired off muskets and cannons for sport, which put the Wampanoags on full alert. Ninety armed natives marched to Plymouth to see what was happening, and they stayed to make sure the British weren't planning anything violent. The eventual feast was not one of thanks and respect, but one of distrust and aggressive action. Another, quote, Thanksgiving would only come 16 years later when the Puritans were celebrating their recent massacre of the Piquot tribe. Yay! Even this wasn't what we think of as Thanksgiving today, but instead a day-long Puritan fast and remembrance of God. The holiday and concept we know as Thanksgiving started in George Washington's 1789 Thanksgiving Proclamation, where the Puritans aren't even mentioned. 
The holiday wasn't celebrated nationwide until 1863, when Lincoln declared it a national holiday to try to keep the country united. Even the myth about the Indians and the pilgrims didn't even come about until the 1900s, yet still this story is taught as fact in schools across the country. So, this holiday season, forget about this made-up story of kindly Indians and grateful, friendly pilgrims, and instead, honor the natives of then and now with Native American Heritage Day. Sixth grade students, to get outside today for extended recess, you must have a pass that looks like this. If you lost your pass, you may need to wait a minute so we can verify that you're on the list. If you do not have a pass, please stay seated and wait for instructions. Remember, you must have an extended recess pass to get outside today. Thank you. Wait for teacher's instructions in the cafeteria and we will dismiss to go outside. Mysteries of Vernacular Tuxedo Men's evening wear for semi-formal occasions. Tuxedo, surprisingly, has its roots in Native American history. The Delaware Indians of what is now the Northeast United States were divided into three subgroups, distinguished by their animal totems. The turkey, the turtle, and the wolf. Members of the tribe belonging to the wolf totem were often referred to by the indigenous word for the four-footed canine, Tuxit. In the 18th century, Europeans who settled in the former region of the Tuxit anglicized the name as Tuxedo and slapped it on a town in southeast New York. Decades later, in the late 1800s, a lavish resort was constructed and christened the Tuxedo Club. It was at the Tuxedo Club, around the turn of the century, when a dress jacket was required for almost every occasion, that a brash young man, heir to an enormous tobacco fortune, caused a stir by flaunting tradition and donning a formal dinner jacket without tails. His bold fashion statement was quickly popularized and nicknamed Tuxedo, which in modern America is the headache of high school prom attendees across the nation. Last week, our Smarticus question asked, where did the word tuxedo come from? And you had to look for the hint in the question with the word indigenous, which should have led you to realize that this word actually originated with the Native Americans. Well, I thought it would be a lot harder to trip you guys up than it really was. So congratulations to the following equal readers for correctly identifying that the word tuxedo means wolf in Algonquin. Those equal readers are Matthew Zayner, Isaiah Hamlet, Carter Zisso, Dorian Johnson, Karma Burke, Ethan Elliott, Nijay Stafford, Gloria Bongo, Caron Brown, Alicia Perez, Destiny Heberly, Gilmaki Gardner, Joshua Oladeji, Quadir Evans, Zaya Flowers, Deshai Claw, Adriana Ardon, Elijah Glaspie, and Ernest Nyarko. Congratulations, your Eagle Bucks are in the Eagle Buck Bank. It is time for I Am Smarticus. When you find out the answer to the question that follows, message Ms. Hill, and if your answer is correct, your name will be added to the wall of Smarticuses. Who is the famous Lakota warrior who resisted U.S. efforts to take possession of Native American lands, notably at the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876, and is being immortalized in stone today? It's time to figure it out. E 
Each day, we have thousands of thoughts. Scientists say we have at least one thought every two seconds. That's at least 40,000 thoughts a day. Some of those thoughts are ideas. Some are memories, things we learn, or opinions. Our minds are amazing, and thinking is what makes humans so great. But sometimes we get too many thoughts in our heads, and this can make us feel worried, tired, or even angry. Imagine that thoughts are like bubbles. They pop into your head. They grow and float around for a couple of seconds and then pop and disappear. Some thoughts don't pop and go away though. They keep growing and stay floating around your mind for days. These big thought bubbles are usually questions that cause us to worry, such as who will play with me at playtime? What are they whispering about? Will I get an invite to the birthday party? Mindfulness helps us to blow away some of those bubbles that we don't need. We don't need to worry. It doesn't help with anything. Having fewer thought bubbles clears your mind and makes space for learning new things at school. Listen to the quiet music and breathe normally. When you see a thought bubble come into Bertie Brain's mind, then do a deep breath to blow it away. Remember, when we do deep breaths, just your belly should be moving, not your shoulders. breathing normally and listen to the music. We shouldn't hear your breath because this means you're breathing too quickly. Well done. 